You are about to watch my interview with Dr. Cornell West. I don't do many interviews on this channel, but uh, he and his team reached out to me and I thought, oh, well, I have to interview Cornell West, of course. So uh, <laughs> I did. We talked about a number of topics, including, of course, his decades-long fight for a better world and his run as a Green Party candidate. We do disagree there on where votes should go in 2024, but I think we had a productive discussion on the differences in strategy there and our differing thoughts. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. All right, I'm joined now by Dr. Cornell West, who, of course, is a philosopher, an uh, author, an activist, and now a Green Party candidate for president, and we'll uh, get uh, a bit into that later. But uh, Cornell West, thank you so much for uh, joining the show. No, well, thank you for having me, though, brother. Definitely, I, I salute you. Uh, it's, it's, I think, I'm pretty sure you're going to be the only presidential candidate I actually talked to on this show, so... <laughs> It's good, to, it's good to have you on. I'm sure a Trump or Biden won't be coming on. Um, but we got some issues to to get into. So let's before we even get into the Green Party stuff, I, I do want to just get kind of your your thoughts just just generally on how do you stay motivated? Because this world is uh, a hell of a thing. It's, it, I mean, story after story, there's a lot of depressing stuff going on in the world. How do you manage over all these decades to continue up, you know, your fight, regardless of of how you're fighting? How do you continue to stay motivated and really speak to all these issues that you care about? You know, brother, that uh, I've had so much love, integrity, and courage poured into me by Irene and Clifton West and Shiloh Baptist uh, Church and the Black Panther Party when I was growing up that I believe we always begin with catastrophe and despair. Despair is not something that you uh, evade. Despair is your intimate companion. And like a blues man or a blues woman, right? That catastrophe and despair is integral to who you are. You just don't allow either to have the last word. See, if you're trying to evade despair, then that's sentimental. You're going to end up cynical. And cynicism is the flip side of sentimentalism. And that's basically just a matter of immaturity, not growing up. You know, when you, you you Disneyland, 12 years old, Main Street with your popcorn. You think the world is so and so. Then you discover, God, you got predatory capitalist processes all around the world. You got these vicious white supremacist, male supremacist practices. You go, oh, I'm overwhelmed by this evil. I can't take it. Well, no, this is the way the world is. Now, what you going to do with it in light of the traditions, resources, stories, narratives, that has been given to you by those who came before. But in the end, it's, it's fundamentally about the love and courage more than anything else. And because I had to pour it into me, I can't even take credit for it, though, man. You know, mom and dad's love, I didn't deserve that, man. I just showed up and, and it, it overflowed, you see. And so I, I'll never ever have a, um, enough despair that would lead me to allow despair to have the last word. And that's true no matter what, no matter what what the circumstances, no matter what the conditions are. Because let's face it, man, you know, nihilism is the largest movement in the, in, in the world. The great Rabbi Heschel used to say nihilism is the largest ecumenical movement. And nihilism is what? Might makes right, manipulation, subjugation. It's cowardly, but at the same time, it's tied to the ego. It's tied mm -hmm. to a narcissism. And so in that sense, the question becomes, well, what goes against that nihilism? Well, that's the hope, love, justice, social movements, uh, friendships, I mean, all the things that go against the dominant ways of the world. Because it's a, it's a cold and crude world now, brother. Yeah. You, yeah, you know that. <laughs> oh, no, indeed, indeed. So for, for you, how does, how does religion play into this? Because, you know, often the way we see religion portrayed, uh, at least, the, you know, the dominant form of it in, in mainstream is... A very negative view is very much, you know, restricting of rights as opposed to celebrating our differences. How do you see religion different, and how does that how does that play into into your life? Well, one, see, religion at its deepest level is about courage and love. I mean, as a follower of Jesus, when he goes into the temple and runs out the money changers, the largest edifice on the other side of Rome, four hundred Roman troops are guarding that edifice. The disciples move away he's by himself and it leads toward crucifixion right so that uh, he had a tremendous courage 
based on a commitment to poor people to run the money changers out. Not because he hated the rich, he hated greed, he hated avarice, and he hated cowardliness. So that prophetic religion is always about courage and love. That's Amos, that's Esther, you gotta take a stand. And in taking a stand, you're not taking a stand for popularity. And most importantly, uh, especially as a black man in America, it means that you're not on anybody's plantation. You see, part of the problem these days is that you got folk talking bad and acting as if they X or Y, but they still on the plantation, man. They got a Marxist analysis of everything but themselves because they still own the plantation, which means they still have this dogmatic allegiance. They still have this deep loyalty to an, or to an orthodoxy based on their livelihood, based on how they're going to make their money. And that's true in the professional managerial class. That's true in the lump and pull of professional managerial class. And to be a follower of Jesus, and the same is true for prophetic Judaism, prophetic Islam, Malcolm X, Malcolm X, love and courage, right? Fannie Lou Hamer, love and courage. God can't use cowards. Freedom movements can't use cowards. Relationships, you know, your <laughs> little precious son you got, right? That yeah. in your relationship, you, cowardliness cannot play a, a crucial role in your relationship. It's not going to last. Yeah. That's just a fundamental law of life. Yeah. But our whole system tries to make people cowardly. And, 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 and religion at its best frees you up. You're a free, free, free man, free woman, free sibling, free they, free them. It frees you up. Now, this is prophetic religion. The dominant forms of religion just reinforce the fear, the deference, the dogma, the orthodoxy. But I'm talking about what it means to be a genuine follower of mm -hmm. prophetic Judaism, prophetic Islam. Prophetic Buddhism, the way Bell Hooks was a free black woman, free Buddhist, critical of Buddhism, not on anybody's plantation. You see what I mean? That's the crucial thing. And that's why I always bring it back to the music, though, brother. Because, you know, Coltrane could have stayed on Miles Davis's plantation for the rest of his life, been a rich man. <laughs> and even being on the plantation, he was free because Miles freed him up. But he had to break loose, bring in Eric Dolphy and bring in Archie Shepp and bring in Farrell Sanders. And bring him McCoy China. And you know, his first pianist was a brother named Steve Cohn, who was a white brother. Coltrane got in a lot of trouble. He was a Harvard graduate. Coltrane got in a lot of trouble bringing Steve in. They said, Well, how come you got, you got Red Garland? You got all these. Bad. Hey, I like his sound. I like his sound. He lasted for about six, nine months. I saw Brother Steve in the club just the other day. And I mentioned Coltrane. He broke down in tears. Why? Because Coltrane was a free man. It's hard to be free. It's very, very few really free people in the world. I'm telling you, Dostoevsky's point, the brothers Karamazov, most people can't bear the burden of freedom. They'd rather stay on the plantation. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it is is simply how you grow up, your surroundings, sort of this this culture that we are you know, brought into. And there's a lot of people simply, I mean, don't question their surroundings, don't question what they're told, and they end up just sort of repeating the same mistakes that we've been making uh, for years. And going back to religion, I mean, but right. I, I'm not religious, but 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 seeing like, there's an obvious connection there between religion and the environment, right? Like, take care of the world, take care of the environment. I saw you recently at, a, at the big climate march. Uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, what needs to get to, to be done, or what steps do we need to get to, to be able to accomplish what needs to be done when it comes to the climate crisis? Well, I think more than anything else, my dear brother, Anthony Rogers has been really on top of this with me and for me, that we need to bring together what you saw last week in New York City it was beyond climate emergencies, climate catastrophe. That needs to be brought together with Stop Cop City in Atlanta. And it needs to be brought together with UAW strike, Hollywood strike, worker strikes. We have to have a solidarity and a coalition of people who can come together long enough to bring significant and substantive power and pressure to bear on the status quo that is characterized by massive organized greed at the top, fossil fuel, 
that we talked about in regard to climate on the one hand, right? The militarized police that's tied to not just the government, but surveillance and national security systems. And it's, and it's international, right? It's not just Atlanta, but it's connected to various parts of the world in Africa, Latin America, Israel, defense forces, all of them are tied into that particular way of militarizing the police and they're all there together. And the same is true with UAW. Look at the level of greed of these CEOs. Look at the level of greed of the profits being 60% and the workers 6% wage increase. I mean, it's just, it's spiritually obscene, man. But the only way you deal with it is courage. You got to be willing to fight. You got to be willing to fight. Brother Martin used to say, I'd rather be dead than afraid. You can't be a coward. I'd rather be a corpse than a, 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 than a, 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 a coward. I mean, it's, 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 a, um, it, it, it's a spiritual and a moral issue in terms of who's really willing to stand up. And thank God, the beautiful thing is, there's always a cloud of witnesses, brother. Yes, every, so country, every color, every gender, you're gonna have a slice of people who get off the plantation mentally, intellectually, physically, and fight. And on that fight, I mean, as, as you brought up all these strikes going on, the, uh, the fight for trans rights is, is a real, you know, uh, Issue Very now. important thing, our precious trans. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you contextualize all these fights that are happening now with you know your decades of seeing society and and how it's either evolved or devolved? Do you, is this from what you have seen? Is this sort of a unique moment that we're seeing right now with with this this on? I mean, these fights in terms of the strikes, in terms of the fight for trans rights. Is this a a unique moment, or is this sort of a a, re a repeat of what we've seen in the past in terms of other struggles? Well, I think it's unique in the sense that it is the major uh, effort to get at the counter-revolution. You see, going back to the 60s, when I emerged as a young person, we had revolutionary fervor, Black Panther Party, Nigga Revolutionary Black Workers, and we can go on and on and on, SDS and so forth, right? And then you got counter-revolution with first Nixon, then Reagan, then the Democrats started imitating the Republicans, and then the, 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 uh, the capitalist, predatory capitalist uh, processes began to reconstitute themselves with a class war on poor and working people. That's what neoliberalism is. It's a class war on poor and working people. It's a massive redistribution of wealth from working people and poor people to the well-to-do, redistribution upward. That's what we've seen for the last 50 years. Now, and I, I, I resonate with the language of my dear brother, Sean Fain. You know, he says, this is the generational moment for the trade union movement, not just for the trade union movement, for progressive, for people of goodwill who are concerned with vulnerable people. Children, look at child poverty doubled just in one year. You saw that? It, yeah. it, had, been, it had been cut 50%, but then the law expired and, and it, for the first time ever, you say, well, my God, this level of indifference, this level of callousness. And so it's, 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 it's the, these, the, the wave of strikes on the one hand, but also the waves of, uh, of social movements trying to get off the ground around Stop Cop City and trying to get off the ground, uh, especially around uh, climate catastrophe. And you can see the ugly and vicious attacks of the state on our 61 and now 66 brothers and sisters dealing with Stop Cop City. And you watch the vicious attacks that shall escalate as the strikes intensify, especially the UAW. I know Hollywood workers have been out for a good, good while now. Mm -hmm. And more and more strikes are beginning to take place in various workplaces, you see. So I think it's a very, very pivotal moment and we have to be there and we have to keep the standards high. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's, it's never about hatred and revenge. It's about justice. It's mm -hmm. about compassion. Because if it's just about hatred and revenge, you just remain a parasite on the status quo as host. 
But if it's about love and justice, it provides an alternative. See, people are hungry for an alternative. One of the reasons why fascism is so seductive to a lot of people is that it is a genuine alternative mm -hmm. to a weak neoliberal order. And people are hungry for an alternative. Now, once they got it, like, like for example, Trump going down to Detroit in a couple of days acting like he's pro-worker. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. It's, it just is it's more than a joke, you know. It's just, yeah, it's just ridiculous. Pathological, right? But he presented himself as an alternative because the Democratic Party has been unable to deliver. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, what we're trying to do in this campaign, which is nothing but a moment and a movement, to provide an alternative for fellow citizens. There is another way other than the rot in the Democratic Party. There's another way other than this Democratic Party that's beyond redemption. And it's an alternative that's very different than that of Trump. So I do want to get into your run. I have some questions around, you know, just the, the whole idea of the run. But sure. separate from that, do you think a politician can also be an activist at the same time? Or does the nature of being a politician mean that you have to, at, at the best, you can work with activists on the outside, but you have to be able to work within the system that currently exists, because if you don't, then essentially you're out, right? So, but I wanna get your thought, like, can you, is it possible for an activist to also be a politician? Can those two things coexist? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was an activist his whole life. And he was in Congress for 20 some years. Harold Washington was an activist, mayor of Chicago. Why? Because he always had an organic connection with the movement outside that gave him more wiggle room as he worked on the inside. Mm -hmm. Now, you're right. It's very rare that you get politicians who are activists. There's no doubt about that. Most politicians are just mediocre, milquetoast conformists, obsessed with status and concerned about the next election. Yeah. No backbone you know, willing to check and see which way the, the wind is blowing. Uh, unfortunately, that's the level of uh, of politics we have. You know, the great Saul Bellow, he's a fellow Canadian. He, he, you know, he ended up in Chicago. He's a great novelist, deeply conservative, brother that I have disagreements with, but he's a great novelist. He said politics is low comedy, uh, especially in America. And it's true. It's true that for the most part. Mm -hmm. But there are a few exceptions, though, brother. Henry Gonzalez, I don't know if you knew Henry Gonzalez from Texas. He was in the house for 35 years. He was a great, great progressive. He's an activist his whole life as a congressman. But it meant that he stood alone oftentimes. You know what I mean? So let's get really into your campaign now. Because I'm I'm curious, what what is your goal with the campaign? Because I mean, I, I'm not sure you can admit it, but you're not going to become president just based on not based on the fact that you're not you shouldn't be president or you don't have the talent or the knowledge <laughs> to be president, but based on how the electoral system works, right? You got first past the post, you have the electoral college. Ross Perot won 18 percent in 92, didn't get one electoral vote. Uh, what what is your ultimate goal with this campaign, knowing that you are not going to be the next president? Well, I don't I don't accept that. I, I, uh... I have no chance whatsoever of winning. See, I think history is much more unpredictable than you're projected to see. History is unfinished and incomplete. We don't know what's going on in real time. We are witnessing the very slow but undeniable uh, collapse of the Democratic Party. We'll see what form it takes. Biden may not end up being the candidate at all. Who do they have on the bench? Not too many folk at all. The Republican Party's already been uh, hijacked by Trump, so that the establishment in that party is long, long, long gone. And Trump may not be the candidate at all. Who do they have to fall back on? Hardly anybody. What happens in a moment in which both Trump and Biden are not there, and the only three people is myself and two others? Let's go to the stage. Let's have a public debate. L let's travel the country. Let's see. You don't know, brother. You just don't know. I feel man. like so, I do, but. <laughs> no, no, I don't believe in closure, man. I don't believe in closure well, like that. We are running to win. Now, okay, now given the fact that you say, okay, let's just move from certainty to probability. 
there yes. is a probability that you will not win. Of course, absolutely. But what does that mean? That means I have to bear witness to what is inside of me. There's no way I can remain silent given the corporate duopoly. There's no way I can remain silent when the two-party system is an impediment for the unleashing of democratic possibilities of poor and working people, not just here and around the world. There's no way I could sit back and simply be a spectator given what's going on, even in electoral politics. I never spectated in terms of social activism, but in electoral politics, you see. So what this campaign is about is, it is the spillover of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer and Dorothy Day and Rabbi Heschel and Edward Zaid. What were they concerned about? Abolition of poverty, abolition of homelessness. What are they concerned about? Ensuring that there's a fundamental commitment to the militant wing of the labor movement in terms of not just higher wages, but more and more control over the conditions of their workplace. Decommitment to feminist movements in terms of women having control over their bodies, ensuring that women are treated with dignity. And similarly so in terms of any, any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, effort to be silent about vicious legacies of white supremacy. So that it's a matter of laying bare both a vision and analysis, but most importantly, a witness, a bearing witness, and a bearing witness what? In a collective manner. It's not an isolated voice. I'm not an isolated voice, an isolated candidate. I'm just one wave in an ocean. I'm just a moment in a movement of trying to get people to see things differently and feel things more deeply and to be able to act more courageously and compassionately. So as you know, that has a moral and spiritual dimension to it, right? A certain kind of wave of awakening, getting people to see things differently. Well, that's what, that's what social movements are all about. How yeah. do you get people to see things differently? Yeah, I, I, I would argue though that I'm not, I'm not personally sure. I'm not sure if your message is more effective as a Green Party candidate than it would have been, say, challenging through a primary. Why did you not choose to to challenge Biden through a Democratic primary as a, you know, choose that instead of doing the the Green Party run? Because be, oh, you know, my I think the, you... the the primary yeah. I just think would have gotten you more attention personally and would would have been able to um, push your message out further. Maybe put more pressure on Biden because he actually has to potentially speak to you know that contingent of Democratic voters. When it comes to a Green Party run, they essentially could ignore you, and media could ignore you, and there's not much done there, right? So why do you feel like a Democratic primary run wasn't uh, a more effective route? Well, one up to now, I haven't been ignored, as you know, I haven't been ignored at all. That there's been a whole lot of vicious attacks and assaults. I'm the minister. You know, well, yeah. I mean, constitutional <laughs> order. I'm not, yeah, they're either going to ignore you or attack you, right? Like that's kind of the strategy. Well, well, no, but attack is not being ignored, though, brother. Let's let's just okay. make that clear. Yeah. Let's make a distinction here, right? But secondly, you see, the right and the Democratic Party is so overwhelming that there's simply no way that you can have a fair process in a primary. If you you talking about getting ignored and dismissed, look at RFK. Look at uh, Sister w w Williamson. That's what it is to be ignored and, and, and dismissed. And they know that in a few months, it's over for them because they've already rigged it in such a way. And you know my two, my two uh, 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 campaigns with my dear brother Bernie Sanders, it was clear that they had rigged it. It was clear that they treated him unfairly. Yeah, and, but and, you don't think uh, a third party run is less effective? Like I, I would argue, I agree with you. Yes, the the, right. the system in terms of the two party system, in terms of the primary system, there is definitely you know a weighted that's scale true. there for sure. But that's right. you would you you don't think that a third party is even less of a chance? I mean, Bernie at least was very close to winning the primary both times. Yes, he when it was. comes to a Green Party run, you could even you could still get like you know twenty percent of the vote and not get one electoral vote. So I'd, I would argue that it's more rigged against third parties than it is against primary runs. Well, I mean, it's it's rigged against all poor and working people as a whole. I mean, you know that. I mean, what was it? Uh, I think as Emma Goldman used to say that if uh, if voting could lead toward revolution, it would be illegal. You see, so the ballot is never 
the primary means by which you fundamentally change the society, yes. you change society with waves of awakening, with consciousness raising that allows people to stand up and hit the streets and be willing to go to jail. That's what I mean by social movements. And this yeah. campaign is, is, is simply an ex expression of a social movement. It's so that I would never ever think that just the ballot in and of itself is going to lead toward any kind of uh, uh, a fundamental social change. But I'm convinced though, you see, once you run in a primary of a rotten democratic party, brother, and they ask you the to even say, I just want to interject though, the, the support, the to support the candidate, support Biden. Yeah, but the, the party's only rotten because of who leadership is, right? If you change the people, like the, the party is not a person, it's it's a collection of individuals. If That's you right. change if you change what the leadership of the of the, that party is, then the party can change. So it, it's That's true. That's and because true. this because the Democratic Party already has, you know, its its fingers in everything, I I would argue it's just it's a there's a much better potential there to actually have some some real impact through the electoral process. I agree with you in terms of how real change is made. It's it's through social movements. It's through the ground up. It's not through, um, you know, these runs. But then that kind of undercuts your run as a Green Party candidate, right? Like that kind of it kind of lays bare that this, you're not going to become the next. I mean, again, this is my opinion. You're not going to become the next president based on this you system. You got a right to your opinion. You got a right to your opinion. <laughs> but I, I do want to mention, though, like you. So I, I'm curious what why your opinion has changed because back in in 2020 you did vote for Joe Biden because you thought that Trump was you know the threat that he, that I would argue he definitely is and you could argue he's even even more of a threat now with four indictments 91 charges why do you think Trump is less of a threat now than he was back in 2020? Well, I mean, I supported Ralph Nader in 2000, as you know, supported Jill Stein in 2016. So I've got a I've got a history with third parties. Uh, we tried to form a uh, revolutionary black independent party in 1980 in Philadelphia. So I've been very much part of third party formations. But there were there were moments in which when I supported Biden over against Trump, was I was hoping that Biden would be able to speak to some of the issues that Trump's social base was concerned about. And he had four years to do it. And he didn't do it for me. I know a lot of the liberals think this is the best economy that we have. It's only 3% unemployment and 2.8% so 2 inflation. And I said, my God, have you walked the streets? I'm, I'm at 110th Street right now in Harlem. Do you know the levels of inequality, the levels of social misery? You think those statistics that you think look so good in any way reflect the level of suffering in this economy, please? get off the crack pipe so that unfortunately Biden would not only didn't come through but when it comes to foreign policy and leading toward the possibility of World War III with his military adventurism uh, it, it, in some ways it was worse the worst possible nuclear exchange with Russia the, the strangle holding of I Russia mean, I would, provocation I would argue Russia. that's I would argue that's not the I would not want Trump as president right now. I, I would, I would guess that it would be much worse under a Trump presidency on on, on every level than it is under Biden. I'm not. It's not a defense of Biden. It's just saying that the reality of the situation with the with the electoral politics, and as you even you know admit the the limitations there, that That's right. and the reason you voted for Biden in 2020 is because you voted against Trump. It wasn't really for Biden. Anti, it was it was, it was against. Right. Yeah, it was, it was an anti-Trump vote, which. Is right. just the the nature of first past the post and how things currently have to operate based on the way the system currently is. Uh, you know, do you think that the, maybe the Green Party should invest more in local races, state races, as a way to build up the party and try and and create some energy around you know uh, at a state level, local level, as opposed to just going you know full throttle for the top of the ticket every four years? Because if if there's going to be a successful Green Party national party, right. You need to have the foundation there, and even just let, let's say you you even get five percent of the vote, federal <laughs> matching funds, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Like it, that's about ten million dollars. That's not going to win a campaign. You saw the Reform Party hit that, you know, ninety two, ninety six. Then Pat Buchanan got less than one percent of the vote, and that was with federal match. He had the twelve million dollars from federal matching funds. 
got went from eight percent that party did to less than one percent of the vote so that money didn't help him it, there really has to be a foundation for the party i i think for it to for any third party to be able to to build and and be competitive what are your thoughts uh, on, this, on that is this, is this a reflection of your running for the green party there in canada in Canada, it's different because it's it's a parliamentary system. So right, there, it, right. it really depends on what riding you're in. And but since I ran, you know, this is back in 2015, I've had sort of a, a different, you know, back then I thought, hey, you know, if we get some percent of the vote now, we'll get more next time. We'll get more next time. We'll grow it that way. I've come to learn that's not really how it works, right? It's all about where the investment is, what what riding or in American terms, what district the the um the investment is in. If there is enough of an investment from the party into certain areas, you can definitely win some seats. The Green Party, I think, has has two seats right now, uh, but they've hovered around there for a while. It's it's really tough to it's even tougher, I think, in the American system for third parties because it is not a parliamentary system, and it really ends up being this this two party system. And unless there is a um, you know a proper investment on the local level, on the state level, to build these parties, I just think any every four years it's going to be you know, it, it it could be a way to raise some issues um, that maybe aren't necessarily uh, discussed as much during uh, these sorts of uh, these elections. But in terms of actually building the party up and a chance for it to win, I just don't think there's there's much of a hope until I mean, there is the foundation under a I, national run. No, I hear what you're saying. I mean, one of the things we are deeply concerned about is promoting the, uh, the ranked choice voting and proportional representation at state yeah. and local level, which you, the parliamentary system is very different than the two-party system in the state. That's a real possibility. The abolition of the Electoral College itself is very important. Yes. But but I think what, what, what I am picking up, though, brother, is that it seems to me you are suggesting that it's really impossible to break with the two-party system and the status quo in that sense because every four years you're going to have an anti-republican party vote see that that becomes a just a regular cycle because the republicans are throwing up such gangsters and then we act as if well the democrats are better but the democrats have their gangsters too and what happens to poor people what happens to working people what happens to folk in the global south who are suffering given u.s imperial policies you see we've got to have a break sooner or later and you say well Let's start at the local and national level, but so much is rigged at that level too. I mean, it's it's a different it, level of rig, right? It's I, well, I think it's a different different level of rigging, but yeah, but it's still rigged though, man. Because it, just in terms of try, try, trying to get your message out, it, yeah. But so I mean, different. this this goes back to what we discussed earlier about. Right. The real progress is made through activism, right? I I don't think it's made uh, yeah. at the electoral no, level. We, the ele we agree with that. We agree yeah. with that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. in terms of all of these, I mean, this is why I look at this is how I view voting. I view voting as a tool. It's best used depending on the context that you're in. And if that means you're voting for you're voting against somebody uh, to prevent the worst case scenario, then that's that's how it is. That doesn't mean that's the end of your involvement in democracy. You right. could obviously, right. you know, involve yourself right. more when it comes to activism in that fight. But but in terms of just, you know, voting and how it operates, Unfortunately, this is the system that we are currently in, and until there is the the foundation for some real changes, it's you know it's a hope and a prayer every four years voting for a third party candidate. And ultimately, you know, I, I'm not someone who thinks you know you can blame Green Party voters if you know right, a, right, a Republican right. wins, because ultimately it is on the party, <laughs> it is on the Democratic Party to to reach voters. Um, Absolutely. But you know, with that said, I don't want people thinking that you know. Their vote is is should be the extent of of their involvement oh. in in, oh, a better, in in a better world. I yeah. agree because in the end, we really are talking about a revolution. Revolution is the sharing of power, the sharing of resources. Poor and working people of all colors and genders and sexual orientations need more resources. They need more wealth. They need more power. They've been dominated. They've been manipulated. And how do you engage in that kind of revolution? And see, I don't see how that particular revolutionary orientation can lead one to somehow thinking that, well, the Democratic Party can be taken over by uh, uh, the demos vis-a-vis -vis the oligarchs. The oligarchs have a stranglehold on the Democratic Party, brother. That big money and big military, as you know, 
just as well as anybody else. They are at the center and the core of the Democratic Party. That's what Bernie found out. And I, I don't see how, this is what I mean by rot. I mean, it's Shakespearean. Something is rotten in Denmark. Well, something rotten in the Democratic Party, right? That's, that's Hamlet. And uh, I, think, I think the Shakespearean insight is, is, is true. So what does one do? I mean, this is part of what our conversation is about because all of us are desperate. Anybody concerned about poor and working people, anybody concerned about the environment, anybody concerned about these police and uh, uh, shooting and murdering too many folk, especially black folk, anybody concerned about domestic violence with women and so on, and especially anybody concerned about the uh, trade union movement getting crushed by these greedy uh, uh, bosses, we're desperate. Yeah, We are desperate, though, brother. At least I am, and, and I'm sure you are, too. No, I, I mean, the, the, it's... It, I mean, I wake up, I look at the news, I'm just like, God, like, it's it can, <laughs> that. That's why my first question to you was like, how do you, how do you deal with this shit? Because it's every every day there's, there's it's something new and it's a, it's an ongoing you fight. Keep, but you just got to keep fighting, though, man. Yeah, I have a, uh, exactly right. I have one last question. This is sort of a, a one off. I'm just I'm just curious because you're such a a larger than life figure. What do you do? You have hobbies? Like, what do you do for fun <laughs> that that is not involved in? in your activism in, in in writing like do you do you do anything that's just sort of like your downtime maybe watch movies like what is what do you do when you if you have downtime well, brother talking to you is fun <laughs> <laughs> i'm having a good time though you know what i mean absolutely but no no me and me and me and my beloved wife you know we go to 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 the jazz clubs and hang out with the great uh, Ron Carter and spend time with Christian McBride and the one and only uh, Cyrus Chestnut. We spend a lot of time in the clubs. And as right. you know, you know the, the brother Arturo Ferro, you know, we won a Grammy last year, right? Mm. The Afro-Latin Jazz uh, uh, Orchestra on Four Questions of Du Bois. So I spend a lot of time in, uh, in clubs and things, but I like to read. I mean, I read two or three hours every night, no mm. matter what. A lot of check off. A lot of check off, brother. All right. Well, there you go. Music and reading. That's what Cornell West does <laughs> in his free time. <laughs> All right. Well, th thank you again, uh, Dr. West, for uh, for coming on the show and, and having this conversation with me. Thank you. Thank you, man. You stay strong, though. <laughs>